This is Public Resource. When I started Public Resource in 2007, I started by posting video from congressional hearings, which resulted in a bit of a set to with C-SPAN. After they sent a takedown to Speaker Pelosi for posting video of herself testifying before Congress, I started buying all their hearings and posting them without permission. Now, to their credit, they changed their policies to disclaim copyright over government works. Since I was doing video, I started looking around the .gov world and found that the executive branch had a long and distinguished record of making great video. I convinced the National Technical Information Service to start shipping me their old tapes. I digitized them, posted the videos on YouTube and the Internet Archive, then sent NTIS back a disk drive. This was the birth of FedFlix. When Barack Obama took office, I got to know David Ferriero, the newly appointed archivist of the United States. He had great plans to put the archives online, but things go slow in government, and I offered to help. And that's when I started working with Thomas Gideon. In the middle of a blizzard, David Ferriero, Thomas Gideon, and a bunch of volunteers joined me at the offices of the Sunlight Foundation and kicked off our International Amateur Scanning League, even made the New York Times. Thomas led a group of volunteers who showed up at the National Archives with DVD duplicators and stacks of blank DVDs. They systematically started copying government films and sent them back to me in California. I bought a half a dozen DVD drives and ripped them all to disk and uploaded them. Fedflix now has over 6,000 videos and the channel has had over 87 million views on YouTube. A bit later, the Smithsonian started sending takedowns to an artist on Etsy that was using 19th century seed catalogs to make cute arts and crafts. This stuff was all public domain, and the Smithsonian is certainly an instrumentality of the United States government, one whose chartered purpose is the increase and diffusion of knowledge. I created a site called What Would Luther Burbank Do? that stated our position that our nation's addicts shouldn't be locked up behind a cash register. As a form of protest, we started using those seed catalogs on coffee cups, which we called increase in diffusion of mocha mugs, and beer glasses, which we called Smithsonsteins. All these items had the phrase used without permission on them. Thomas made us a killer beer, our nation's addict, an American pale ale made with victory hops. The labels all featured seed catalogs and used without permission. We also made postcards. We, we went to town. We sent all that stuff over to the Smithsonian Castle just to make sure they knew what we were doing. And we hosted a great reception over at the New America Foundation. Hundreds of people sent in postcards to the Smithsonian asking them to change their policies. Did they? Well, it took a decade for them to change their policies, but a senior Smithsonian official told me that it would have taken way longer if we hadn't tabled the issue so definitively. They didn't talk to us, but they noticed. We made our point. My goal at Public Resource is always to get the government to do the right thing, to post materials on their own volition. If they won't do that, then we do it for them, but that's a temporary thing, a means to an end. You've got to make sure the authorities know you've got an issue with the status quo. You can't question authority if authority has no idea you're there. When I posted the official code of Georgia annotated, I sent a copy of that code to the Speaker of the Georgia House on a George Washington thumb drive. They apparently noticed since they sued me, and they called me a terrorist in their complaint to boot. In my years of agitating to free the PACER database, I've encouraged people to send in postcards of protest. We even created a PACER polling place at the Internet Archive to get people to come in and write their messages. I sent those postcards to members of Congress and judges. Did it do any good? Nah. <laughs> Not yet, at least. But if you're going to tilt at windmill, sometimes the windmill will be oblivious. It took me 10 years to help get the U.S. patent database properly online. It will likely have taken 20 years before PACER will have changed. The reason I print and make and create this kind of stuff is partly because I love to print. My grandfather was a working printer, and I used to go to his shop and typeset. 
The stuff we print is a great way to say thank you to our volunteers and donors. Nothing like swag to keep people involved. But printing is more than that. You have to present your case if you're going to change the way things work. Perhaps that means walking to the sea to make salt or sitting down at a lunch counter in defiance of the law. Perhaps that means putting a code on a thumb drive. The stakes can be as high as justice and civil rights, or the stakes can be as mundane as changing your local school board policies or something in between. You can't do activism unless you're active. You've got to tell people why you're there, why they should listen. This is the ancient art of petitioning authorities to affect change. In Hinswaraj, Gandhi was quoting Justice Ranade when he said, petitions serve a useful purpose because they are a means of educating people. They give the latter an idea of their condition and warn the rulers. For me, this is all about printing. For Thomas, he makes beer and open source software. We all do what we can do. What's important is that you do it with purpose. Open Access Ninja. It's the brew of law.